The Sword and the Rose, Chapter 1. Riders ri coming up on Tanesk Road, shouted the watchman, flying a banner. By the time the chief guard captain reached the stark gray, blue-gray stone walls, there was considerable motion, commotion in, the, in Grandel Castle. Fourth hand Olav, chief captain of the guard of Grandel Castle, frowned as he ran a gauntleted hand down his chin. He caught hold of one of his under-captains as, as the man rushed past. We're a bit crowded up here. Seems everyone is up on the walls who thinks he's any sort of reason to. If our baron's coming in, we best get some of the folk down. Take a few man, men and see to it. Yes, Captain. Forwraith caught another guard by the elbow. Find under Captain Salant. Tell him I may, tell him I said make sure he's watching the three. He'll know what I mean. Yes, Captain. The, st the crowd on the Greystone battlements thinned rapidly as people realized the unwisdom of bringing themselves to the attention of the new Baron until they knew something of his temper. All that remained now was the guard and some noble knights whose rank allowed them to ignore the guard. Forraith did not waste his time trying to persuade these. As the name Hanolov indicated, he was not nobly born, and the nobly born would simply look at him as if at a smear of some horse manure on their boots. After his men had cleared the walls, Captain Forraith took up a position over the Tonask gate. He knew that his own status was a bit more uncertain. He had spent, he had spent all his life in adult life in the guard, and he was not of noble birth. Those two facts could tell either for him or against him when the new baron was deciding who of the old baron's men should stay or go. He could see the device on the banner now, a red single rose with a cr crossed with a sword on a background of white. He did not recognize it, and he knew most of the major her heraldry, of, heraldry of the kingdom. He stroked a hand down over his thick mustache and graying beard. A minor house, a younger son to boot. What kind of expectations would he have of Grant? Randall. Last fall, a message had come through to say that for joining the rebellion, led by the peer, led by the prince, Baron Raphael had been executed. His barony had been presented to Gual Gualsor Dar Randolph, third son of Baron Randolph, as a reward for saving the life of the king in battle. This is all they knew for certain. Rumors had gathered over the weeks since the announcement. No woman of passable looks was safe from him. A, a handsome young boy could go far in his service. He was a cruel man, and there would be hangings and whippings every day, and so on, and so on. And now he was coming, by surprise, as it were. They ought to have had a message earlier in the spring to say he was on his way. Of course, with the kingdom in the process of settling down from a failed rebellion, many things, messages and the like, might be forgotten or mislaid. Now the party wound its way through the through Grandel Town, the mass of shacks, sheds, shops, and stalls outside the castle. It was time to go down. The new lord would expect his captain of the guard to meet him at the gate. Forath turned away, then turned back again suddenly. One of the horses had antlers. Father's boots, a reindeer. He looked again at the man riding the reindeer. The rider had no beard and wore his hair in three long black braids. He was indeed one of the Lefeta, one of the reindeer people of the north. But Forath had no time to stand gaping. As it was, he nearly had to run to reach his position in time. In theory, he could make the new lord stand outside and demand entrance in the name of the king. But that was not a good notion when a new lord was coming to take over what had been the barony of a rebel. Of course, the new lord could find fault either way. But it seemed to Forath that having the gate already opened would be the lesser offense. The new baron and his party rode in. Clue 
hooves clattering on the, on the cobbles, banner flying above them. There seemed to be something odd about the gar Baron's left hand, though Forth couldn't quite make it out through the crowd surrounding, surrounding him. People lined the courtyard, wanting a sight of their new lord. The crowd is dressed mostly in the browns and blacks of the common folk, interspersed with the brighter colors of the merchants and nobles. They all knew what this moment meant as well, and no one moved forward, as they would have done for the old baron. They did not surge around him, shouting greetings and wishing him well. They were, in fact, on the edge of being sullen. One of the under-captains shouted commands, the guards did a proper salute with their spears as the new lord came in, accompanied by a five, five men at arms and a herald. He returned the salute with a wave of his hand, and now Forrest saw what was wrong with his left hand. It was missing from the rest down, replaced by a leather cuff which protruded with an iron hook. Forrest cast a look at the baron's face and saw that he was young, blonde, and had pain lines around his mouth. In the brief moment of silence after the Baron and his party came to a halt, a young boy's voice piped up. But he's a cripple! Forrath recognized that voice. He groaned. Father's boots and shirt sleeves, Jedal. You're the one person above all others who not, ought not to have said that. He turned and looked at the crowd. The Lefeta at the Baron's side said something that sounded like, Loxia! And the sword scraped out of its scabbard and 12-year-old 12, 12 Jadel Dar Koikens, nephew of the late Baron Rafal, was suddenly aware of the gravity of, of the situation, stood white-faced beside his mother. But the new Baron grabbed the Lafetta by the arm and spoke sharply. Have done, Melga! Has there been en blood enough to s and to spare spilled these past three years? And if we start slaughtering ill-mannered boys, who will be left alive? My lord, the dark-haired warrior grudgingly sheathed his sword, but the frown stayed on his flat, olive-colored face. The baron looked toward his herald, who had been waiting for the signal. The herald brought the horn to his lips and blew, blew a long blast. Hardly needed, needed to fix the situ Hardly needed to fix the attention of this crowd. People of Grandel Castle. While Sor Dar Randolph is sent to you by your king to be your rightful baron, to receive your fealty, and to administer the king's justice, in two days' time, all matters that require hearing may be brought before him. Here, in the name of the king. The people's response, in the name of the king, was rather less than wholehearted. The baron turned towards the steward, who was standing in his set place beside Forath. You are the steward? I am, my lord baron, Ralno, Ralno Dar Harvant, steward at your pleasure. It was no mere formality. When a new baron took over, whether by inheritance or otherwise, any of the previous officers might or might not be replaced by the new baron. Two wagons with an escort of 20 men are coming up to, are coming up to, to three days behind us. Will there be quarters for them? Certainly, my lord. See to it that there are places for the people of my party, according to their station. My man, Malgothop, will require a chamber near, near to mine. Certainly, my lord. The baron fix, turned to fix his eyes on Forath. Captain of the guard? Forath Hen Oldov, my lord. Captain of the guard at Grandel Castle, at your pleasure. The baron smiled. A mere upturning of the corners of his mouth. Good day to you, Captain. Would you care to accompany me while I speak to the young boy with no manners? Yes, my lord. For his heart sank. He led the way over to where Jedal stood. His mother had an arm around him protectively. But if the Baron decided to take action, there was nothing she could do to prevent it. She was quite young, with a rounded face and narrow chin, and determined expression. Her status as a mark of rank was clear from the style and material of her green gown and white cap. The Baron looked at the two. Your name, boy?
Jed Eldar. Quainus. Raphael's heir, my lord. He brought up his shin defiantly. Raphael's heir? How is that? His mother spoke. When Raphael's wife died in childbirth and the, and the child with her, my lord, that left Raphael's brother, Quainus, as heir to the barony. The baron continued to look at Jadal. And did your father march to war in the train of his brother? The baron's voice held a weariness that was from something other than the long journey. No, my lord. He died in a hunting mishap three years ago. The baron turned his eyes, his gaze to the woman. You are the boy's mother? She looked the, the baron in the face, standing up to him as much as her son had done. Bryn Marpatvin, widow of Coinus, my lord, I am the boy's mother. He nodded, almost dismissively, as he turned his attention back to the actual culprit, Jadal. You need some teaching, and I need a page. Report to my chambers in the morning. Bryn moved forward, pushing Jadal behind her. My lord, no! She protested. If there is punishment, let it follow me as a boy's parent. While Sora's eyes went a little wider at that, Madam, I said nothing of punishment, rather that I had thought it something of an honor to be paid to the Baron. If, of course, your son can prove himself worthy of it. You shall not harm my son. The weariness is back in his voice again. Lady, I have no idea what sort of tales you may have heard of me, but I doubt that anyone seriously suggested I eat children for breakfast. If it will ease your mind at all, he shall spend his nights at home with you until you are convinced that I mean him no harm. She began a further protest. My lord! He cut her off. My lady, I have spoken my last word on the subject. If you wish to make further protest, talk to my steward, and he will see that you are given the opportunity to pre present your case to me at, the, at a proper time. Jadel should be in my chambers in the morning and return to your quarters in the evening. He turned his horse and rode away leaving the two looking after him in apprehension. Fourth, it was the leading baron, and his party were up, party up the steps to the keep. Was leading the, sorry. Fourth, was leading the baron and his party up the steps to the keep, when a page rushed up. He glanced at the baron a little fearfully, and then spoke to Fourth. Captain, I have a message from under Captain Salant. He said it was urgent that you talk to, to talk, that you talk to him at once. Did Under Captain Salant not be knowing that what I be doing right now? Yes, Captain, he said he did. But he said it was urgent that he speak to you at once. Forth glanced at the Baron, who waved a hand. Go ahead, Captain. I'm sure one of your men can manage the formality of escorting me to my chambers. Yes, Lord. Forth looked at one of the guards. Son Egg, you be senior man here. Take charge. Yes, Captain. The stone corridors echo echoed with the sound of booted footsteps and jingling accoutrement, accoutrements. Sorry, as Gosal, Gosor, Walsor, and his party followed the steward to their assigned rooms. Close behind them came a party of six castle guards. The corridor was mostly unadorned gray stone, with sconces for torches at intervals along the walls. There were a few old and faded wall hangings as well, but these did not did little to deaden the echoing effect of the stone. Melgothump smiled his thin smile. Impressive pile, my lord baron. Gwalsor's mouth twitched into, into a barely perceivable smile. Not too loud, Melga. There are enough people in this barony who are leery about having a new baron without having that the new baron's right-hand man sneering at them. Hang on a few, my lord. That'll settle them down. Sorry, hang a few, my lord. That'll settle them down. The baron's face grew serious. There'll be somebody hung, will I or nil I, Melga, just because they're too stiff to bend at the times. But for every one that dies under the rope, there'll be one, another one or two long forgiving me for it. For a man who made his name as a warrior, my lord, you are you are seriously soft-hearted. Soft-hearted? Perhaps I am a little. I wonder, though, if he only had a brief warning from 
That's right. They only had a brief warning from this from the sudden scuffle of rushing feet out of the cross corridor. Torch light bringing bringing flickering gleams from the naked metal. Luxaya. Malgothops Malgothops sword came out of the scabbard, parrying striking parrying and striking in two swift moves. Gwalsor had his blade out a heartbeat later. Three ambushers all wore all bore swords and wore light brigadines and metal caps. The dim light showed little more than that. Age or youth, beard or no, they were skillful though. Melgathap, in a furious sword work, held the attention of the two of them. But third slipped bath slipped past him, heading for Gwalsor. Metal clanged and screeched on metal as Gwalsor parried two hard blows and struck the struck in to cut the man across the belly. By the time he moved to help Melga, the last of the ambushers lay dead, as the spearmen of the guard rushed up with spears leveled. Melgathap looked at them with a sword looked them at them over a sword held in almost negligent a negligent low guard position. His mistrust mistrust was well nigh palpable. Palpable. Palpable? Nope. You know what that word is. I can't say it, but that's what it is. Yeah, and I'm not happy with this one one character's manner, like the way he's speaking. So I'm going to probably be changing that. So I'm going to try and change it while I'm speaking. <sighs> Malgothump looked at them over a sword held in almost a negligent guard position. His mistrust was well nigh palpable. You're seriously slow, no? His scorn was scathing. Our Baron could already be dead for any good you lot make, or maybe you just want to make sure he's dead. There was a little mutter muttering from the men-at-arms, but none of them made any excuses. They were experienced men, and knew that it was neither right nor reasonable, neither right nor reasonable, for, to hold them responsible because the pure formal duty of escorting the Baron to his chamber had turned into something else. They knew also that right and reason had little place where nobility were concerned. The chief of the party addressed the Baron. Lord, best some of us ought to be going before you before you as well as behind. <clears throat> well, Sora nodded. More importantly, who are these men and who sent them? Chief of the guard party inspected the corpses. Lord, I know them all. They were sworn men of the mighty Baron. Might, might be they fell down on the ground to take some sort of revenge for him. His sworn men? And yet they did not follow him to war? They were down with the belly sickness, Lord, and, and the Baron, he wouldn't take them along. Everyone knows that if one man in the army ha has belly sickness, soon many will be having it. There is rightly seven of the sworn men sick, but only these three came through it. And before, and before they were well enough to travel, all the battles were fought and not remained and not remained for them to do. And they were allowed in the keep knowing well that they were the Baron's sworn men and none questioned their presence and the fact that they had swords. The guardsman was too old and experienced to be flustered. Lord, they were the Baron's sworn men. They know the ins and outs of the keep and her hidden ways. Like as not, no one saw them. Well, Sora was still not satisfied. He stared at the man in the face. Stared at the man in the face. Perhaps and perhaps not. Send some of your men back to Foraith with the word of his of this incident. Tell him I expect to look in him to look into it, and I will hope for more of a report that than than that they were hidden. Yes, Lord. Gwalsor turned to the steward, being the chief steward. Ralno was out of the habit of carrying weapons, and the action had gone too quickly for him to do anything. You noticed nothing as you went past the corridor? Ralno is trembling. Lord, the light is bad, and my eyes are not not so good as they used to be, and I had my mind on your quarters, not the corridors. I see. Well, let us carry on, and I certainly hope there are no more such surprises in store for us. The steward 
finally reached the appropriate room and threw open the door. Melgathop stepped ahead of the Baron, sniffed quickly, then stepped out again. Something is seriously bad in here. In there. Ronlo's face quivered with indignation. Lord, the chamber was made fresh when it was first known that you were to come, and the servants went to make certain of it that your, when your banner spied on the road, and I can smell nothing bad in there. While Sora smiled his brief smile, no, my good Ronlo, this is nothing like a dead rat under the bed. My man has the ability to smell magic. Apparently something has put a curse in this chamber. He sighed in ex exasperation. A poor welcome, I would say. First off, the old baron greets me with the poorly chosen words. Then I am attacked in the hallway. Now this. His voice was mild, but Ralno sh shudder shivered visibly. The pain lines on the young baron's face were more pronounced now. Lord, let me let me lead you to a, let me lead you to a different room where you may wash and rest from your journey. In the meantime, I will see to it that this room is made right. A uh, good notion, Ralno. And I will wish to interview the ma magician you bring in before he begins to work in my chamber. Yes, Lord. The steward called to a servant and gave rapid orders for fetching of water and refreshments, then led the party down the corridor to another set of rooms. He opened the door and stood aside to let Malgathap step in. The Lafetta sniffed, then turned. Seems all right, my lord. Good. They stepped inside. There were two chair, chairs and a small bed. Gwalsor took one of the chairs. Ralno looked at Malgathap. Malgathap returned the look, his face looking, his flat face impassive. I, I will stand for now. As you wish, my lord, my lord, as you wish, lord, my lord baron, servants will be coming directly with water that you, that you may wish and that you may wash and a pitcher of wine as well. That said, to fill up the empty space, he knew the baron, that was said to fill up the empty space, he knew the baron would have heard his orders to the servants. The baron merely nodded. They stood or sat in uncomfortable silence. Ralno, Ralno finally spoke. This smelling of magic, is it something all the Lafetta do, my lord baron? Malgathap answered, no. Only ones, no, ones who do so, Lafetta drive, the, drive out among, from among them. They make them go and live in the woods, in the, in the wilds alone, or far off among strangers. Ralno looked at the stolid olive face and was quiet, attempting no more con conversational sallies. At last, a rap on the door announced the return of the, of the servants. One carried a bucket of water, another a basin, a third a pitcher of wine with several clay goblets. Following the steward's hand signals, they set these down, then retired to the corners of the room to await other orders. Ralno picked up each of the goblets, which were upside down on a tray, turned them over, and poured a little wine into one. He drank down. He drank this down. Lord, he said, if anyone has poisoned this wine, I will die first. Do you wish to wait, or will you drink immediately? The Baron looked up. If there is such an, in an intricate plot laid as to involve ambushers in the hallway, a curse on my rooms, and poison in my wine, why, I might be dead before midnight. By no mean, by one means or another. Let me try the wine. Malga, will you drink as well? Half a cup only, if it pleases you, my lord. The grin the baron, the grin the baron gave, turned his face into a voice, much to the steward's surprise. Very cautious, aren't you, Mal Malga? The Lafetta's mouth quirked it slightly at the corners. Then the round face was impassive again. I should go back and tell your father I let someone kill you because I I was drunk? He'll skin me out and use my hide for a heart rug. Hearth rug. The Baron snorted. Ha! Nearest I've seen you to drunk was the night of Fred Avan's promotion, and you were still alert to knock some sense into Goldatch's sons when they started getting a little bit too mellow, remember? 
But now I'm making sure, my lord, to your health and good long reign. To your good health and long reign. Ralno ushered in a chubby little man wearing a blue doublet and hose with a flat black cap on his head. The magician Pember Pemberland, my lord. The magician bowed deeply, pulling off his hat, well dressed for his station, well sore considered. We can hope that he, that means he's as good as his work. You have been told why you are summoned? No, my lord, only that you wished my services. I see. Well, there has been a curse put on my chambers, and I wish you to remove it. He kept his eyes on the wizard's face. He had no idea of the number of wizards in the locality, and it was possible that this was well, the one who had planted the original curse. Yes, my lord, and not knowing who is who in the barony, you wish to be sure that I will simply not trade one spell for, the, for another. It was bold speaking from a magician to his baron, but Gwalsor had no objection to that. Can you remove the curse? Almost certainly, my lord. I may say, without boasting, that there is not a magician in the castle or the town superior to myself, and I think I should have known if a new magician had moved into the neighborhood. Would you be able to tell which of the other magicians in the area planted the curse? The magician looked doubtful. Possibly, but if it's one of the simpler sort, any hedge wizard could do, there may be nothing about it sufficiently distinctive to make an identification. Well, Sora's lips thinned. Go to it, then. At once, my lord. I shall have to return to my quarters for my gear. Good. I wish to sleep in my chambers tonight, and there will be an added reward for having it done in good time. Pemberland bowed himself out. The Baron looked at Ralno. My good steward, I would be alone for a little while, for a little. Have a, have a servant waiting near enough to take messages or do whatever service I may need. Yes, my lord. After Ralno had gone, the Baron looked at his man. Well, Malaga, what do you think of our wizard? He's probably half as good as he claims. He'll, he will remain loyal to you as long as it is in his best interest. When you find when you find he's involved in plots against you, then you know it's time to flee for your life. There was a rap on the door. Four Wraith entered, holding himself erect. Baron, that fool of an under-captain, he was supposed to know where they were at every moment, but they gave him the slip. Lord, after what happened here, I'll not blame you if you remove me from my position. I've for, arranged for guards to be on duty outside your doors, choosing the men myself. Men, I think, have no feelings to a title that is past. That done, I will lay aside my office. I have failed you, my lord. He slipped off the large chain which hung the bat, on which hung the badge of the old baron and handed it to Gwalsor. The new baron took it in his hand and paused for a moment. For Wraith? Hen old of? How did you come to become how did you come to be a captain of the guard? Forraith almost sighed. I I ought not to be here, my lord, then he spoke. The old captain, Frank or Dartharis, died in his bed. A little after we heard word of the old baron's death, and no other nobly born person was wanting a job from which they could expect to be removed when the new baron arrived. So it fell to me, the senior of the under captains hold the post. And do you still wish to serve me? Forraith looked at him. Is this the new baron is this new baron given to making cruel jokes? I do, my lord. Take back this badge then. Have the base of a chain to represent my arms and wear it until such a time as I demand it back. Yes, my lord. Now these guards at my door how many are they, and are, how are they armed? As I've said, my lord, I've chosen men who I'm sure will have no, have no ties to a title as past. For that reason, I've not been able to set only guard, only spearmen. I've had to choose, I've had to choose pairs made up of spearmen and an ar, arbalest deer. Of course, the arbalest deer 
will only carry a sword since I do not care to have a crossbowman outside my door. My lord, he'll not be having a cr he'll be having no crossbow. Twouldn't do indoors. He had had the difficulty of keeping the lower class accent of his speech while he was under stress. I do not care to have a crossbowman outside my door. For I th heard the Baron's voice go, start to go high, then cut it off. As the Baron took a breath to say something more, Mulgathap murmured, Luxia, from behind him. Forath nodded. It was clear that the Baron was upset and that he might say something he may, he would later feel that Forath Handola had no right to hear. Best, best to leaving. I'll be taking care of it, care of it, my lord. He slipped out before the Baron could call him back. Gwelsar took a deep breath and turned to Malga, Malgathap. Did I make a fool of myself, Malga? Did I show my fright for all the word, world to see? The Lutfa shrugged. You worry too much, my lord. He sees only that it does not please you to have an albuster outside your door and, and sees you only argue so much no more. And if there are more, what then? Surely, surely a man who lost his hand to a crossbow ball and nearly die of it, he feels testy about such things. Save that none of the people here have any notion about how I lost my hand. But your men at arms drinking in the taverns this evening, by mid-morning, the word the word may, would go for, for, to the furthest reaches of the barony. Not that far, surely. At least the very depths of the castle. With many, with many change to show your serious, with many changes to show that you are a seriously valiant fellow, hero. Serious hero? Recalling the day last year, the dust, the heat, the smell, for some strange reason, of wild roses, his first real battle, a wild melee around the king. The king had chosen him, seemingly at a whim, to ride the royal train that day, rather than behind his own father. He heard sufficient mutterings, though, to make him aware that the king had brought him along, brought him in along with a few others, as hostages. Gwalsor's father, not sufficiently well known for for the king to be entirely sure of his loyalty. The battle had become a confused hammering of dins, a hammering din of steel on steel. And then he had seen the man with the arbalest, a rat-faced fellow with a scraggy brown hair and mustaches aiming at the king. Without a second thought, he had flung up the shield, interposing it between the crossbow and the king. There had been a smashing blow and amazingly little pain. Then the king was looking at him with surprise in his eyes, and Gwalsor was having, pro having trouble sitting in his saddle. He awoke from time to time, and someone gave him a drink that put him back to sleep again. He remembered first that his left hand had been wound with bandages. It was hot and swollen. Then suddenly that it was gone altogether. A nervous surgeon had explained that they had had to take it off because it was coming, coming infected. But even then, he was too groggy with the sleep draught to care much. He shook his head and brought himself back to the present. Well, there are things that must be done. Go out and send for the steward. My talk with Forath has reminded me that we must replace the badges of my old baron with my own. I suspect that Ralno has been seeing to that already, but I'll have to be sure. And that is the... the beginning of the next story. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, it's a different type of story, as you can tell, um, from the seemings of things, from what I, my first impressions, or is that it's going to have a lot more um, intrigue in it. So, but I'm not really sure. As always, these are kind of as-is manuscripts. I don't know what's going to be happening next. So have a good night.